children out there who'd like to come forward for a few moments. Before they call, I will answer. 
while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. The Gospel reading comes from uh, the 21st chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning at the 5th verse. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have some version of this moment in the ministry of Jesus. It uh, happens in the week before the crucifixion. It is while Jesus is uh, in the temple uh, uh, confines, it's called, that is within the, within the, the precincts of, the, of, the old, of that temple. And um, he responds to some comments about how beautiful the temple is by predicting its destruction. And goes on to describe uh, a series of events um, that are terrible. And in this, in Luke's gospel, he goes on to talk about uh, the way, uh, what the destiny of the disciples will be. Um, now, in the lectionary, the logic of the lectionary, if you will, uh, just so you know, the, the lectionary is a schedule of readings that begin with the beginning of the church year, the first Sunday in Advent, and conclude these last two Sundays before Advent. And this Sunday, two Sundays before the close of the church year, always pick up uh, themes of what is called the apocalyptic, that is the revelation, revelation at the last times. And they're not comfortable scriptures. They're not comfortable scriptures to uh, listen to and not particularly comforting to preach about, I will tell you. Uh, oftentimes when I had uh, staff, I would often say, why don't you preach this Sunday? Um, but I don't have anybody to say that to. So. Um, now, the lectionary ensures that over a three-year period, the church will hear texts from nearly every part of the Bible. And uh, the purpose of the first half of the lectionary is to uh, have us walk through the life of Jesus. So in Advent, we anticipate the birth of Jesus. Uh, Christmas, the birth of Jesus. The season of Epiphany begins with um, uh, our celebration of the visit of the Magi to the Christ child. It includes the baptism of Jesus. And then there's a, a season in which we reflect on, on what it means that Christ has come into the world. Then we celebrate Lent. We anticipate the life, death, or the death and resurrection of Jesus. We have the season of Easter, which goes up to Pentecost, the beginning of the church. And then there's an extended period that goes from like mid-May, depending on when Pentecost is celebrated, until these last two weeks to essentially reflect on what it means for us to be Christians and grow in the spirit. Uh, that's why the colors are green for, for Pentecost. Um, but today, we are coming on uh, these, uh, these last two Sundays. This week, the Apocalyptic Sunday, and then next week is Christ the King Sunday, the, the bracket on a whole purpose to, uh, to our being together, which is uh, focused on who Jesus is. Uh, so, in all of that, please be open to God's Word as it comes to us from you. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be done? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you're not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am the Christ, I am He, the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, 
but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and plagues. There will be dreadful portents and great signs from them. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish by your endurance. Gain your souls. Here in Germany. I'm always tempted when I deal with these texts to, uh, to really let loose with a hellfire and brimstone sermon. You know? It's going to happen to you. Disaster's coming. Are you ready? The end is near. The end is near. Um, somehow I don't have all the vocabulary and energy for that, you know, so I'm going to do my normal thing. I, you're normal, you're feeling normal, I'm normal too today. We were having this conversation. Uh, did, did, did you hear what, what's going to happen for, for the disciples? Did you hear that? We're going to get arrested? How would you like to put that in the church brochure? You know, come and be members of Richfield United Church of Christ, and what, what's your destiny? Arrest, trials, all this suffering and trials and so forth. Who's joining now? Well, I don't know. Jesus didn't have it in mind that we put that in any kind of a brochure. I'm making light of this, but it's actually a pretty troublesome text, isn't it? It's kind of a troublesome text. You and I are not comfortable in mainline church with the apocalyptic. There's some churches that are organized. So their whole reason for being is to continue to keep the all the things going on and um, the kind of a th theological the, the God breaking through and making everything different. Why that is? I, I suspect in some way it's because that uh, there are some people who really want things changed. They're not the winners. They're the losers. They're the ones who see no hope for them in the present structure of things. Who would that be, you suppose? your own minds. Who are the people for whom there doesn't seem to be any hope? Now, people who don't know how to, if you will, uh, win in this economy, in this system of government. But who are those people who, who don't have a voice? <coughs> Anything that we read, especially out of the Old Testament prophets, like we read in Isaiah, and then again in the Gospels, the people who are hearing that are people who are oppressed. In Isaiah, and there are other prophets who also have these visions uh, in, in which God is going to do this absolutely new thing. Live under oppression. Uh, they're occupied by some foreign army, some foreign empire. And their yearning is for God to set things right. Well, when they look at the world, they see so much evil, so much corruption, so many things broken, that they don't know how anything can be changed gradually. Well, well let's wait for the next election. And, and we'll, we'll throw out the incumbents and we'll bring in some new people. Uh, so we have to wait two years for the next cycle. 
No, no, we can't wait that long. Something has to happen now. Please, God, make it happen now. How will this little nation, this little nation of Israel, throw off Babylon? How, 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 will, this, how will this little uh, unorganized nation of, of Judea throw off Rome? Beyond any power. Only God can do this. Only God can do this. And out of this suffering, there, there arises this yearning. Is it yet hope? I'm not sure. That God will make it right. That God will, in essence, take hold of the corners of creation and go, <laughs> and start over. Some people will be losers. Some people will be winners. And some people are going to serve God's end one way or the other. That's, that's the power of the apocalypse. Now, like I say, in mainline church, we don't, we don't usually uh, uh, fool around with this stuff. I wonder how many of you, and I asked this in both uh, the first service and church school, how many of you remember uh, the book from the 1970s, uh, The Late Great Planet Earth? Not many, a couple of you. Uh, Hal Lindsey was the author of this book, and in my Christian experience, it was the first time that I ever uh, heard about this stuff. Oh my gosh, the world was going to come from Jesus was coming back in 1980. And when he came, he was coming back, and boy, was he ticked. Right? And he was going to put everything right. Everything that happened in Revelation was going to come true. Okay? And, um, you know, if you weren't on the right side of things, you were going to be thrown into a lake of fire. Okay? Wow. Oh, my gosh. I remember how disturbed I was. And, you know, trying to understand all this. Um, well, 1980 came and went, and everything was still the same. Do you remember Y2K? Oh my gosh, the computer world was supposed to crash down on us, remember? And, and New Year's Eve came that year, and we went, <gasps> nothing happened. And then last year, the Mayan apocalypse. <laughs> Remember, the Mayan calendar ran out on December or something or other, 2012. And I'm sure you all held your breath. You know? is, is, is this one real? Is this one real? Now, you know, as moderns, we have a different sense of time than the ancients did. The ancients believed that time was cyclical, that it would turn and turn over and begin again. We have a sense of time that um, uh, on one level, we think time is eternal and as far back as we might think it, it, it goes all the way back, infinity. And time forward, infinity. I mean, even if you come to understand uh, Big Bang Theory and that, you know, at one point everything was, everything was, and we have the universe. And eventually, the prediction is it's all going to go back to this little thing again. And what happens next? <sighs> happens again. Time is eternal. Time is eternal. And, and so we don't think about it. We don't think about it in the same way. And yet, I think what I'm about to say is true about our faith. If we try to pasteurize, the Christian faith, and take out the sense of urgency, the sense of urgency that comes with the apocalyptic, then we are left with, um, we're left with a philosophy. We're, we're, we're left with something to discuss and not something that urges us to 
there, there, that there's a deadlock. A deadlock. In a manner of speaking, I think that there are, depending on, again, whether you're a winner or a loser or what your position is, where you're standing at any moment, may determine whether you are looking for God to do something different than what you see. It, it depends on where you're standing. I, I was looking at some pictures this week of, um, of, the, uh, of, of the Philippines and the damage done in that cyclone. And I saw a picture which uh, is taken from a, a fairly good distance away, maybe 50 or 100 yards away. And, and there's this scene in which all, all, all around that there, there are you know, trees and buildings that have just been laid waste. It's just piles of debris. And standing in the middle of it, there is a man. He must feel as though the apocalypse is coming. And I realized that the picture looked familiar. And so I, I entered Joplin Tornado. Now I've been to Joplin a year afterwards. And you can you could still see where the tornado went through. Because uh, there was nothing there. Uh, it stripped the bark off of trees. Literally stripped the bark off of trees and grass off of the soil. You could still see it where that went. But the news photos actually had, from about 100 yards away, somebody standing in the middle of what used to be a suburban neighborhood, surrounded by the neighborhood. All that destruction. Some people think that that's, that's what's going on in human history, that, that, that God is going to make that trouble, you know? Make things fall down. Why? So that things can be put right. You know, from my preaching during the season of creation, you won't be surprised to know that I think there's an apocalypse going on now. Maybe not so much for humanity, not, not one that, that we are you know, fully cognizant of, but we're, there's a species going extinct every week. Every week. The, the, the pace of change in the global environment, in the oceans, and the forests, and the wetlands, is going so fast that species don't have their 1,000 generations that are needed to make the adaptations that will enable them to survive. And so, boom, 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 boom. There's an apocalypse going on. There's an end going on. And I'm convinced if we don't do something, it's going to be us. But we're in great denial about that. You hear what I'm saying? It depends on where you are as to whether this stuff makes sense. Now, <laughs> Because I have to come to terms with this in a sermon, you've got to come to terms with it, you know, because you've got to listen to me. Okay? It would be easy for us to just jettison this. That's what we usually do. But I want, I want to keep the urgency and the tension that comes with the expectation that God is still going to do something climactic. This is Gifford's philosophy, so you take it for what it's worth. I think that God comes to us out of the future. <coughs> the history of faith is the way God acted by coming to somebody out of the future that he intended. What did he say to Abraham? Oh, come on, get up and go to a land that I'm going to show you in the future. I've already been there, Abraham, and I'm going to show it to you. God came to Abraham out of the future. If it's, this isn't the only place, Isaiah, where God says, look, I'm going to do a new thing. He's always doing a new thing. I'm going to make a new heaven and a new earth. How, how do things end in Revelation? Who's in Sunday school today with me? 
Who was in Sunday school? Come on, fess up. Fess up, who was there? Nobody. Brenda, you were there. <coughs> you were upstairs. Nobody came. They all bailed on me. Jim was there. There you go. What did we read in Revelation? What's for, what's going to happen? You remember? I'm going to teach. John says, here it comes. New heaven. New earth. God's coming out of the future. He's going to put things right. Now here's, if God's coming out of the future, okay, then I think each and every moment is an inbreaking of God into your life. In each and every moment, all of the love, all of the power, all of the hope, all of the urgency that God wants us to have in our lives is coming to you in the next moment. Where we turned, uh, we tend to look to our past. We, we think that past determines future. And what I'm saying is that the nature of our faith is the future determines the present. We think the past determines the present. No, the future of God determines the Who's in charge? It's not us. The power of God. God is still in charge of creation. Now, the problem is for us, God's going to give us all the rope we want to take. You want to go ahead and be disobedient to God. You want to go ahead and disobey the, the commandments. You want to go ahead and be hateful rather than loving. You want to just live for yourself. God's going to let you do it, but he's also going to let you pay the consequences. But in each and every moment, God is there to say, hey, come on back. Come on back. There's a way for you to be living. And in each and every moment, through Christ, you have a chance to start again. In each and every moment, there's, a, there's an apocalyptic. Oh my gosh. A wake up call. Well, if that's true, then... The way this text ends out of Luke is so relevant for us. Because what it's really calling us, what Jesus is saying to us, is that your discipleship is crucial. This can't be a casual discipleship that you get to do on Sundays only. This isn't a casual discipleship that you get to do whatever is easy and convenient for you. My gosh, the stakes are so high. The stakes are so high. For the world, let alone for you. I mean, but by virtue of your fidelity in the face of God's inbreaking is the salvation of your souls. So what are you supposed to be doing? Well, in this moment, what you're supposed to be doing is pulling out your black hymnal. I mean, pull out your black hymnal. <coughs> Turn to page 39 in the front of the book. Not hymn 39. Page 39 in the front. What are we looking at, Sherry? We're looking at the question for the candidates for the affirmation of faith. These are the baptismal vows one version or another that you took or were taken over you at your baptism and or your confirmation. Here are the terms of your discipleship. It is urgent that you make this the foundation of your life. This is the urgency. God counts on us to live out the discipleship of Christ so that so that the kingdom might be known in its in our time. The kingdom that God is sending out of the future to us. How are people going to know this? For us, through the conduct of our lives, through the way we follow our baptismal vows. What's it say? 
I'm going to turn my back on evil. I didn't mean to turn my back on you there. I usually do like this. I'm going to turn my back on evil. Renounce the powers of evil. You'll spend your whole lives discovering the powers of evil in you. But you're going to turn your back on them. You're going to be fine. And turn towards the freedom of new life in Christ that God is bringing into each and every moment. You're going to claim in a public and private way Jesus Christ as your pattern and redeemer, Lord and Savior. There's, there's nobody else who's going, to, who's going to have a more powerful impact in your life than the person of Jesus Christ. My friends, go read your gospel, see what he actually said and did. That's the pattern for your life. And then what? The next one has the substance to our lives. What's it say? What do we stand for? Somebody read it. Who's got it? You've got it. Third. This one here. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciple, to follow in the way of our Savior, resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best as you are able? There you are. I know what you're supposed to be doing. There it is. There it is. The last one is about your participation in the church. Now, I guess because you know how minds work. You know, you think of one thing, and the next thing you know, you're thinking of something else from about the same time. And because I thought of the late great planet Earth this week, I also remembered this kind of little cliche that was named about in youth, youth groups back in the 60s and early 70s. It goes like this. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to That's finally what Jesus is saying in this text. If you were arrested for being a Christian, you're going to be in this situation. Enough evidence to convict you. The inbreaking of God's hope and love and desire for creation in each and every moment. We have. If there is hope for the world, I don't, I don't know what makes you morally outraged. But whatever it is, if you want it to change, you have to be the change. You can't say, oh, those people ought to. No, it's, it's on you. You need to be the change that you want to see. And those are the terms of the change. I used to, a kid, only half kid, that um, if Jesus truly was going to come again, I've been debating people. If Jesus really was going to come again, what did I want again? What did I want to be doing when I was interrupted? What do you want to be doing if Jesus breaks through and says, let's go, Gene, come on? You know? Tim, here I am. What, what do you want him to be interrupted? What do you want to be doing when he does that? At the time I was up to my neck in trying to get a Habitat for Humanity affiliate started in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I said, you know, I want him to come and find me covered over with rehab dust out of these slum uh, dwellings that I'm trying to. Interrupt me there, Jesus. 